My name is Stephen Sparks. I'm the Executive Administrator for Long Range Planning. Our panelists will introduce themselves in a moment when we uh, get to them. Uh, we have a lot of materials to share with you today, and we hope that you'll find it interesting and will uh, help stimulate a robust discussion uh, with our panel today. Before we get started, I want to review with you our meeting expectations that we have for everyone in the meeting. Those expectations are, we assume best intentions. We all want the best for all of our students. We listen intently to understand better. We are open to considering new ideas. There are no bad questions. Our interactions will be done with respect and we will respect opposing viewpoints. There are many issues facing the Beaverton School District at this time, not the least of which is the return to school of our students and staff. Today, we are discussing the district's future facility needs. This meeting is not the time to discuss other important matters before the district. We request that today you keep your comments and questions focused on the materials that we're going to be presenting you today. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Leroy Landers, and he will um, give you an overview of our uh, meeting today, and we'll lead you through our uh, slides for this open house. So thank you. Mr. Landers, take it away. Great, thank you, Steve. Well, first I'd like to uh, welcome all of you to the presentation this afternoon and thank you ahead of time for attending. Um, we, the entire planning team, realize that you have many different things um, that you could be doing right now, uh, some of which you would rather be doing. Um, but I would like to assure you that participation in this effort is very, very important for the students of your community uh, and for the betterment of learning in your community. So thank you very much for that. Um, to reiterate what Steve said, um, this is uh, really a conversation and presentation associated with long range facility planning, which means that we're going to be focusing in primarily on the, the district's buildings and their sites, uh, and really trying to understand how they might better uh, serve your students and community and uh, support learning uh, in that community. Uh, so with that, um, why don't we just dive right in. Next slide, please. So this afternoon, um, we'll open with sort of a brief introduction of team members and, and what we've been doing over the last few months. Um, we have a couple of slides uh, trying to outline at a very high level what a, you'll see the, the initials LRFP regularly here, that means long range facility plan, what a long range facility plan is. We would like to touch on the district wide sort of strategic goals for education in the community because anything that we discuss related to facilities should really be viewed in the idea of supporting those uh, key strategic goals. And also we'll touch on a brief bond history, specifically the most recent bond uh, and how that was used to improve facilities um, such that they better support learning in your community. Um, We'll then dive into one of the key sections, which is really uh, giving you a high level understanding of district need, specifically as it relates to facilities. And there are three categories that we'll be um, referencing at that time. At the end of that section, the need section, we'll have uh, about a 10 minute or so period of time where you, you'll be able to answer questions or ask questions of us, we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, or if you want to have any other sort of discussion, um, whether it be between other attendees or, or the panelists. So with regard to that, I would ask you to hold your questions until we have that break uh, right after the need section. Once we've had uh, answered your questions associated with need, um, we'll do a presentation on the plan proposals themselves. So there, there you'll be seeing a couple of proposals this afternoon um, that have been developed by the district uh, with the intent of addressing uh, some of the need items that you will have seen. And following the plan proposal presentation, we will have 
two kind of key input um, components, the first of which will be about a 15 or 20 minute uh, discussion. Um, and I'll give you instructions on how you'll be able to participate in the discussion at that time. And that will be followed by a very short six question survey um, or poll that we'll be leading you through. Next slide, please. So our key goals for this afternoon are firstly uh, to provide to you an understanding of the district's facility related goals and the different types of need that have been identified in the district. Our second goal is to present to you the long range plan options and the rationale behind why those options are being proposed to you this afternoon. And the third objective, which is really our key objective today, is to hear your feedback regarding district need and also the plan options. And what I can share with you is that your uh, uh, suggestions or your opinions or observations will be very carefully weighed by the district um, and wherever appropriate will be uh, incorporated into uh, plan evolution and develop, development as this moves forward. Next slide, please. So the planning team, my name is Leroy Landers. I'm a principal at Malum Architects. We have offices in Portland and Seattle. And with me here today is Jennifer Lubin, the senior planner uh, at Malum Architects. Um, we are joined by Frank Angelo, who is a senior planner at Angelo Planning Group. And we have been working together with a key district leadership team uh, over the last a uh, few months actually, to not only understand uh, facility need, but also to develop the two plan options that you're going to see this afternoon. So with us here today, representing that district team are Steve Sparks, Josh Gamez, Aaron Boyle, and Robert McCracken. And as a total team we, working together, we have also been meeting uh, several different times with a 12 member focus group that is comprised primarily of uh, community members and also some representation from local jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So as we're moving through this presentation, um, we wanted to sort of let you know right up front that you should keep these things in mind. We are still in process of developing the plan. What you're seeing today is by no means sort of a baked cake in any way. Um, this is really the first time that we're bringing out um, to the community um, the plan options to receive input. Um, we also wanted to let you know, well, first of all, feel free to ask any question you would like regarding the long range facility plan, but we can't guarantee that we'll be able to answer every one of your questions. We'll do the best we can um, given the knowledge that we have. And in the event we can't answer a question, we'll go back and research it and then try to get back to you if we can after this presentation. As I mentioned before, our primary interest is to hear from you. We want to hear your reaction, your ideas, your thoughts around not only the, the types of need that have been identified, but also the plan proposals themselves. And that we're gonna give you time for questions and comments at two very distinct points in the presentation. Um, and your feedback um, will really become part of a long range facility plan report that will be submitted to the superintendent. Um, and the superintendent will then take that information, um, put it under consideration, and then make a recommendation to the school board. Um, and that could ultimately result in a subsequent, a subsequent capital measure being proposed uh, to the broader Beaverton community. What we're talking about today, the different potential types of projects are not meant in any way to be a promise at this time. Um, there hasn't been a capital measure passed. Um, and so really what we're really talking about is, is some possible ideas um, for the long range facility plan, again, to receive your input. Next slide, please. Frank, would you like to take this or would you like me to take it? I've got it. 
Thank you, Lebray. Uh, I'm Frank Angelo with Angelo Planning Group, and it's been my pleasure to work with uh, Malum, the folks from Malum and the, the school district on this long range facility plan. What I'd like to do is take a, a brief moment to give an overview on what a long range facility plan is, what some of the elements, key elements are, and some of the outcomes of the long range facility planning process are. Uh, the long range facility plan itself is really an opportunity for the school district to step back, take a look at and assess their educational programming in light of their district's facility, the district's facilities. And that's they evaluate evaluating the educational program from the perspective of the condition of uh, the facilities, looking at enrollment trends growth into the future and identifying what facility needs will be needed over the next 10 years uh, to accommodate uh, the uh, students and the, the resources of the district. The plan itself is a 10 year plan uh, and its primary objective is to support the education and success for all district students. There is an Oregon statute that does uh, guide and direct school districts throughout the state of Oregon to prepare long range facility plans. Uh, the, the, this planning process is being done under that uh, umbrella. The district has prepared previously uh, long range facility plans in 2002 and 2010. So we are, the district is now beyond the 10 year horizon of the 2010 uh, long range facility plan uh, that was adopted uh, back then. Those two earlier long range facility plans, the 2002 and 2010 programs, led to uh, some uh, bond proposals that were presented to uh, the district voters and approved by district voters uh, following the adoption of the facility plans themselves. The long range facility plan includes a number of, of uh, elements. The, the state statute ORS 195 110 prescribes a number of elements that need to be a part of a long range facility plan. And that, and these include looking at student enrollment growth, facility condition, capital improvement needs over a 10 year period. Uh, if, identifying if there are opportunities to use existing sites more efficiently and discussing financing options that are available for capital programs in the district. Next slide, please, Jennifer. So, um, next slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was the slide I was working off of. One more slide. Why now? So, the, 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 it's a good question. We've uh, been doing the, this work for the last uh, six months or so. Uh, the, the pandemic has obviously had an effect on uh, the school district, but from a long range planning perspective, uh, it's a, an appropriate time to take a look at long range uh, facility needs uh, in the district. Again, this is a 10 year plan that's required by the state and the requirement is to, for the districts to prepare the plan to be eligible for certain funding opportunities for capital pro projects through state funding. At the same time, the district facilities are continuing to grow in age uh, and maintenance needs continue and have not stopped uh, uh, in the, over the past year. Uh, so the district need, has a number of uh, needs that need to be addressed. It's an opportunity to identify efficiencies in the district uh, to see if facilities and use of, use of property can be used more efficiently. As well, this is an opportunity now to add an equity lens to facility planning, looking at equity uh, between schools at all grade levels. And then finally, it's an opportunity to develop a 10-year plan that looks to uh, potential new capital programs as current bonds are paid back and expire. Next slide, please. The long range facility plan really has three components. As I mentioned earlier, the educational program, enrollment and capacity and facility condition. The educational program consists of a number of elements including the education specifications, which, which describe the, the, the district's um, 
uh, ideal size for elementary, um, middle and high school uh, schools. It also discusses the educational programming element, looks at programs such as kindergarten, PE, STEM, special ed within the context of facility needs. And then it, it, we are bringing in technology. Technology is obviously ever expanding and how technology relates to facility needs and the learning environment is a real important element of the long range facility plan. On enrollment capacity, Portland State University prepares annually uh, forecasts for school districts throughout the state. Beaverton School District gets a, an annual 10-year forecast, uh, so the district knows by grade level uh, how many uh, students they can expect to have over the course of the 10-year period. And that's accounted for and, and, and uh, assessed as a part of the, the planning process in terms of what facilities are needed to accommodate uh, enrollment and how much capacity is needed. Uh, facility condition, the district just completed last year a very major update of a facility condition assessment uh, inventory. So there's, there's a great deal of current information on the uh, conditions of all the facilities, including schools, as well as accessory facilities like the transportation center, the administration building and food services. So the district has a good understanding of maintenance needs and four facilities throughout the district. Next slide, please. So when these three components are assembled in the plan, we end up with the long range facility plan. Uh, this, this is the plan that will go as, as Leroy mentioned, from the superintendent to the school board for consideration and adoption. Following that, the plan is also presented and uh, incorporated into the local comprehensive plans of the cities that comprise the district, Washington County and the city of Beaverton. So the city of Beaverton and Washington County both have adopted and included the 2010 plan as a part of their comprehensive plan. When this plan is done, that will be updated uh, by both of those jurisdictions. And then final slide, please. The other outcome is a balancing and identification of priority needs uh, over the 10 year period and balancing the needs with the funding uh, opportunities and the needs as we will go through in this presentation today include additions to schools, renovation, newer replacement schools, other support facilities, and balancing those with the, the anticipated revenue that would be available over the course of the 10 year period. So with that, that's a quick overview of what is included in a long range facility plan and how the facility plan is used. So I'll turn it back to Leroy. Thank you, Frank. Uh, the next thing we'd like to share with you is really a very high level overview of the key um, district strategic goals for education, uh, just so that we can remember how those would relate to any decision making uh, associated with facilities or improvement of facilities. Next slide, please. So uh, as many of you probably know already, um, the district has some real four key pillars around which um, they strategically are approaching um, educational delivery in your community. The first of these is the expectation of excellence. Uh, the second of these involves innovation. The third of these is embracing equity throughout the community. And the fourth is involving collaboration. And again, all of these are points that are really touchstones against which uh, any plan that is developed by the district and any input you might provide as community members should really refer back to um, from the standpoint of quality of education. Next slide, please. The district has also developed some key guiding principles that will further inform development of the long range plan. These guiding principles are directly tied to the four pillars, strategic pillars. Um, under we expect excellence uh, is really the idea that they would like to strategically plan for the maintenance, modernization, and replacement of facilities. They want to make sure that they are able to meet all state regulatory requirements. They feel that it is important that the community and the district maintain the investment that has already been made in district facilities so that they don't further degrade. 
that as you are considering uh, the management of facilities to consider whether it makes better sense to, in some instances, replace a facility rather than modernize it, depending on the cost associated with the modernization and the most efficient and effective use of public resources. And then at a provide for additions and any expansion needs as they would relate to um, growth of enrollment within the district. Under uh, innovation, um, recognition that there are evolving needs both educationally and otherwise within the district and making sure that the facilities are able to support those needs. Uh, providing flexibility with school facilities. Uh, incorporating sustainability and energy efficiency into the consideration. Under embracing equity, uh, there is the strong commitment that every decision made should be viewed through an equity lens and that the plan should be working toward creating parity across district facilities for the entire community. And as part of that, to really plan very carefully for where you are making any upgrades and improvements. And finally, under collaboration, um, collaborate as you develop the plan for future facility needs. And this evening's meeting is really evidence of that uh, desire for collaboration with the community. Um, and then where appropriate, provide uh, community amenities as part of the plan. Next slide, please. So touching briefly on the equity lens, I mentioned uh, the district is fully committed to viewing uh, this plan and any decisions that are associated with it through a lens of equity. This includes things asking questions as we start to make decisions on whose voice is and is not represented uh, in any given decision. Uh, who does the decision benefit or burden? Is the decision in alignment with Beaverton School District's equity policy? And does the decision close or widen access and opportunity uh, and expectation gaps? Next slide, please. A couple of quick slides on bond history to put this effort in a broader perspective. Um, the first of these is really asking the question, why do we even need bond measures? Um, really, the purpose of a bond measure is to make sure that your district's facilities are able to do the following. Support your educational programs, protect your existing capital investment that's already been made by the community, and to make sure that you're also accommodating uh, any enrollment growth that might happen. And relative to this um, point, um, really the standpoint uh, the viewpoint in developing a long-range facility plan is that neither the district nor the community is really designing building and maintaining buildings just because you like to do that. The intention of this is to very clearly understand that any discussion about modernizations or improvements to the building is really all about uh, finding ways to make them better support education in your community. Next slide. And the way that's done is once a plan has been developed, the district goes to the community to see if that community will provide capital support or funds to make improvements to schools. Uh, and in 2014, um, your community uh, graciously, <coughs> graciously passed a $680 million bond <coughs> that brought a lot of benefit, facility benefit to the community. And what you're looking at are just some of the projects that were undertaken under your last bond. These happen to be the new schools um, that were undertaken as part of that bond. And there were uh, numerous modernizations uh, and improvements on other schools throughout the district uh, above and beyond these that you see here. So the bottom line is that there was a lot of good work done with the previous bond and um, that touched some of the projects in the district. And this is really positioning your community in the district um, to take the next step into the future of education. Next slide, please. So understanding district need, this is now kind of the first very large section um, where we can talk about the three primary areas um, or buckets, so to speak, of uh, need, facility need within the district. First slide, please. 
The first of these areas, um, very purposefully so, involves educational programs. So all of the orange slides you're going to see are directly associated with the educational program area of consideration. One of the ways that we um, evaluate uh, educational adequacy of a given facility is to make comparisons of the gross square footage per student available at that facility relative to certain other benchmarks. So those both nat national benchmarks, um, but perhaps more importantly, the district's own benchmarks that has been established for a given grade level through its development of what is called an education specification. This is a document that identifies programmatically um, the types of spaces that should be put into a modern learning environment and also the overall square footage or size of each of the spaces and the total square footage of the building. What you're seeing here on this chart are the different grade levels broken out. Uh, to the left, you see the list of elementary schools. Each, each bar represents an elementary school. And the horizontal dashed line uh, above those bars uh, illustrates the district's education specification square footage per student. And the blue bars that you're looking at at each grade, grade level are those schools that are very significantly under uh, the target square footage per student that the district has established. So to be clear here, when a district, uh, Beaverton School District goes out and is constructing a new elementary school, they're constructing that elementary school around 122 gross square feet per student. And the blue uh, schools are uh, at least 20 feet or more, 20 square feet or more under that target area. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to that sort of broad approach to measuring educational adequacy, there are a number of other uh, projects that have been identified um, as potential areas of improvement uh, supporting different programs in the district. Um, from the square footage standpoint, the, the metric that we just looked at, uh, if the district were to address every school and bring it up to their standard from a square footage per, per student, um, it's projected that the cost to do that uh, is approximately $260 million district-wide. Now, having said that, um, no district, because of the broad range of ages and types of facilities that they have, no district ever endeavors to do that, certainly never in one fell swoop. Um, they may overtake it over many, many years. Um, but this is really just giving you an idea of the order of magnitude uh, ch challenge that exists from the standpoint of that metric. Some of the specific educational programs that have been identified by the district beyond that include improvements related to special education. These Improvements would involve additions at 12 elementary schools, seven middle schools, and three high schools to align those schools with the district uh, standards. It also includes the possibility of a new or perhaps a modernized standalone special education facility. And for the first grouping of schools, those additions and improvements are projected at costing uh, approximately $100 million. And the freestanding special education facility uh, is projected as being between 14 to $21 million, depending on the exact scope of that project. The second area of specific programmatic need identified by the district includes early childhood education. And this is uh, specifically involving the preschool classroom and uh, support areas that would be made to eight elementary schools throughout the district uh, and would provide preschool at all Title I schools. Uh, the the uh, addition or, or improvement of early educational facilities at that of all those schools is estimated at $13.6 million. The final specific area uh, of programmatic uh, work involves physical education. Um, and specifically, this is uh, a line item that would be associated with the addition of either a gymnasium or multi-purpose rooms to 14 elementary schools 
two middle and one option school um, to make sure that from a physical education standpoint, facilities were able to support uh, that uh, activity uh, such that it would meet the state PE requirements. And then finally, uh, the, there is a possibility of also removing portable classrooms throughout the district. Um, there are 175 portable classrooms currently existing and uh, the district recognizes that having those portables is not an optimal um, condition, both from the standpoint of um, having students be part of the uh, overall school and, and be in the school, but also uh, because of some of the safety considerations with moving children in and out of the schools to portables. Um, if those portables were to be replaced, the estimated cost associated with that is $66.9 million. And what I would like to say about all of these costs here is that it just really underscoring that it's not the intention to say that all of these uh, items need to be addressed in their entirety by any plan. Um, the only purpose here of starting to show what some of the uh, estimated rough order of magnitude costs are is such that you would be able to understand um, the total amount of work and what would really be involved um, from a capital standpoint in, in order to address the various programs. Uh, and then, of course, the equity lens, which we've mentioned, um, when viewed through the lens of certain lenses associated with the equity, namely um, a student population of greater than 50% uh, being eligible for free and reduced lunch, and greater than 50% students of color being enrolled in a particular uh, boundary, um, and 15% English language learners, the following schools start to uh, emerge out of all of the schools um, as falling, uh, as, as being considered uh, essentially. Um, and so you see Aloha Huber, Barnes, Beaver Acres, Shehalem, Greenway, Kinneman, McKinley, Bowes, William Walker are the elementary schools, three of which um, have already recently been replaced by the district. So they are, uh, this really indicates how um, there is an ongoing effort and history with successful um, modernization or upgrading of facilities from the standpoint of equity. And then the three middle schools that you see. Next slide, please. So the key takeaways for our first uh, area of need educational program is that there are eight elementary schools and two high schools that are significantly below the square footage target that has been identified by the district in their education specifications. There are also three known areas of facility improvement to support specific program goals identified by the district. These include preschool, special education, and physical education. And there are nine elementary schools, two middle schools, and one high school that begin to emerge when viewed through very specific lenses associated with equity across the district. And so as decisions are made at given facilities, um, particular consideration uh, and attention should be um, considered when looking at these particular schools. Next slide. Now I want to reiterate before we move into our next area of need, which is facility condition, that all of these areas that we're mentioning from the standpoint of need um, are not suggesting that the school district um, will or should address all of the uh, need that is being identified here. All we're essentially trying to do at this point in time is establish the facts behind what need uh, exists in the district in these different areas, and then later assess whether or not uh, any of this need should be addressed in some way by a capital plan. So the blue area, the facility condition uh, area of consideration, um, really looks at several 
key factors in terms of a high level 50,000 foot summary, so to speak. Um, one of the basic areas of consideration is just how old the buildings are. Uh, and so the chart that you're looking at um, really tracks the age of existing facilities across the district. And the uh, expected life cycle of a given school facility varies uh, on a district by district basis. Some school districts begin to kind of think uh, about a 60 or 70 or 75 year expected life cycle um, and whether or not based on the condition of a facility that should play into what you might do with it whether, regarding modernization or replacement or nothing at all. Um, the horizontal line, um, the dark horizontal line indicates uh, those buildings that are over 75 years old which um, the district has sort of established as a general zone, I would put it, um, for uh, recognizing that these facilities might be, or portions of them, might be reaching their expected life cycle. You see three schools um, over 75 years, the blue bars here. Uh, those include McKinley Elementary, Barnes, and Raleigh Hills. So Raleigh Hills and Barnes tie for the oldest elementary schools. Uh, none of the middle schools are reaching that age, as you can see. And one of your high schools, um, Beaverton High School, um, not only uh, exceeds 75 years, but uh, large portions of it are actually 105 years old. It is your oldest facility in the district. And then Terra Nova in your option schools uh, at 82 years old. Next slide, please. As Frank mentioned, uh, another third party consultant, McKinstry Engineering, um, conducted uh, a very extensive um, facility condition assessment, which was concluded uh, just about a year ago. And that facility condition assessment looked at a number of different um, characteristics of the schools. Um, it tried to quantify as best as possible um, the uh, total uh, deferred maintenance and modernization costs um, required on a site-by-site -site basis. And it also developed uh, an industry standard metric, uh, FCI or facility condition index that is really useful for um, doing a cross comparison of facilities within your district. You can quickly see using the FCI index, um, which of the facilities are um, trending towards a worse condition. Um, and therefore you can look at them with a little bit more critical eye and determine whether or not any of them merit any sort of modernization or improvements. You'll note that once a, uh, the higher the number on this chart, the worse the facility is. So the higher the bar, the worse condition the facility is. And very commonly as a facility reaches a 0.3 rating on the facility condition index, um, which is a, it um, references the ratio of the cost to repair uh, deficiencies in a building as related to a replacement cost of the building, um, then you start to see which facilities are really popping out. And you see at the elementary level, there are seven elementary schools that are in kind of that critical zone uh, from the standpoint of condition. Um, these are West Tualatin View, Cooper Mountain, Fir Grove, Beaver Acres, Raleigh Park, Cedar Mill and Raleigh Hills K-8, um, with Raleigh Hills K-8 being significantly worse um, than any of the other schools from the standpoint of facility condition index. At the middle school level, Whitford um, broaches that critical uh, zone um, and could possibly be considered for replacement. Um, Beaverton High School uh, is your only high school that um, broaches that critical area, um, which is not particularly surprising given the age of the facility, 100 or, or portions of it at 105 years old. There are two schools, option schools, 
that fall into the critical replacement, Terra Nova and ISB, and two of your support facilities, both of them transportation facilities, one at Allen and one the South Transportation Facility, both fall into that critical zone uh, relative to the FCI rating. Next slide, please. From the standpoint of seismic, um, this is also a very important consideration relative to facility condition. Uh, in this chart, uh, unlike the previous chart, the lower the number uh, is, that you see on the chart, the worse condition the facility is. So again, we're paying particular attention to the blue bars because they really stand out as um, within this category, uh, those sites of most concern. And you'll notice the, the uh, darker um, highlighted dashed line, that indicates the line below which any facility is less than a collapse prevention. And so these, we wanna pay particular attention to these schools. The, at the elementary level, this includes Raleigh Hills K-8, Fir Grove, McKay, and Raleigh Park. At the middle school level, there are four middle schools, Mountain View, Cedar Park, Highland Park, and Whitford. One high school that falls below the less than collapse prevention, which is Beaverton High School, and then one option school, ISB. And the gray uh, horizontal stripe above, just as a reference point, is the district goal, which is really uh, the aspirational goal for the district um, to have all their facilities ideally meet over time, which is the damage control range, which is, as you can see here, is a significantly higher goal or objective than many of your facilities currently fall in. Next slide. And I, we thought it was important to show you that behind um, these charts uh, are a tremendous amount of detailed information, which really tracks not only district-wide costs associated with um, addressing deficiencies, but also site-by-site -site basis costs um, that are all tracked and part of that facility assessment. Um, the total uh, deferred maintenance need for the district based on this assessment has been estimated at approximately $610 million when you include seismic deficiencies um, in that overall need. So the numbers that you're looking at here, we don't need to get into them in any great detail really, um, although they are available to um, be looked at and examined include costs associated with structural, mechanical and electrical deficiencies at each site, exterior enclosure and interior finishes, uh, equipment that is associated with each site like kitchen equipment, for example, fire and life safety improvements, and also site related improvements, whether that be parking lots, play areas, fields, those sorts of things. Next slide, please. And then one final uh, area under um, facility condition. Um, each of the facilities um, was assessed by McKinstry as part of their condition assessment from the standpoint of energy use intensity, the EUI scale. And what this is really looking at is efficient operations of your facilities from an energy use standpoint. What this chart is showing you is the higher the bars, again, the blue are, is representing the areas of highest concern, the blue bars, um, the worse uh, energy performance these facilities are. And any dollar that you would spend on these blue bar facilities would give you the highest return on your investment from the standpoint of improving the energy efficiency of that facility. So you will see seven faci facilities, elementary schools that are in the highest zone within five um, for energy improvement. These include Raleigh Hills K-8, McKay, McKinley, Cedar Mill, Shoals Heights, Montclair, and Cooper Mountain. Two of your middle schools um, fall into that category of operations 
opportunity for highest improvement and efficiency, Mountain View and Five Oaks. At the high school level, again, Beaverton High School, it's one of your oldest school, is the one school that falls into the area of greatest improvement from an efficiency standpoint. Option schools, Terra Nova, and then five of your support facilities, two transportation, your maintenance building, um, and the administration building. Next slide, please. So the takeaways for this area is when viewed through the metrics of building age, facility condition or the FCI score, seismic condition and energy use, there are two schools district-wide that fall into the worst category in all four of these areas. Those two schools are Raleigh Hills K-8 and Beaverton High School. The second takeaway is that there are four elementary schools, four middle schools, one high school, and one alternative school that fall into the worst seismic category, which is below collapse prevention. And a reminder that the district-wide deferred maintenance is estimated at $610 million. Next slide, please. Our last category of consideration of need is enrollment and capacity. As Frank mentioned, uh, enrollment projections are provided by Portland State University uh, and its Center for Population Research. These enrollment projections are typically 10-year projections and a 10-year projection is required by the state of Oregon as part of its um, requirements for a long-range facility plan. Uh, those projections not only look at district-wide enrollment, whether it be increasing or decreasing, but also enrollment on a site-by-site -site basis, which allows the district to compare projections against uh, existing capacity at each site. Next slide, please. Uh, we wanted to show you a couple slides which really boil down at a very high summary level um, what these projections tell us. What you're looking at are three maps, one map for each of the grade levels. These maps show enrollment growth and decline across the district. So we are not looking at capacity, we're only looking at growth rates across the district. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see the elementary enrollment uh, through 2030-31. And the important note here, the point, important thing to look at is that while there is projected a 6% enrollment reduction district-wide, hence you see all of the sort of green areas that are uh, projected as declining or reducing, um, meaning you'll have a thousand additional seats available in the district, district-wide. There are several boundary areas which are projected as growing at a pretty rapid rate. Those are the orange areas that you're looking at, the worst of which in terms of growth include Sato and Hazeldale. Sato is 26.9% growth and Hazeldale is 38.7% percent growth. At the middle school level, uh, while the projections coming from Portland State indicate uh, approximately a 3% reduction district-wide, meaning that you'll have 230 uh, seats available district-wide from a capacity standpoint, or, or 230 less students, I'm sorry, there is one boundary area, Whitford, that is projected as seeing some modest growth. So 5% growth at Whitford. And at the high school level, there's a 5.9% enrollment reduction district-wide. So a reduction of 634 students. However, two boundaries, Westview and Mountainside are projected to have some growth with Westview having the highest percentage at 8.3% growth. Next slide, please. And so this slide really kind of lands the plane, so to speak. What it's looking at is the relationship of enrollment projection. So 
where you will be at uh, with regard to the number of students in each boundary area relative to the capacity of that area, the existing capacity of that area. So looking at the elementary capacity uh, up through 2030, 31, there's an indication that the district will have 12.8% capacity remaining district wide. So 2,500 available seats district wide. However, there are several boundary areas that will be projected as being over capacity, including Sato and Bonnie Slope being the worst. Sato Elementary will be is projected as being 174 students over capacity, and Bonnie Slope 126 students over capacity. The middle school level is projected as having approximately 3% remaining capacity district-wide or 240 seats available at the middle school level. However, there are several boundary areas um, that are projected as being over the existing capacity with Stoller Middle School uh, at an overcapacity of 537 students being the worst overcapacity. And the high school level uh, it is projected as having 14.7% remaining capacity or about 1,700 seats available. But one boundary area, Westview, is projected as being over capacity by 588 students. Next slide, please. So there are a few takeaways um, that should be noted within the category of enrollment and existing capacity. The first of these is that there's adequate district-wide capacity at every grade level. However, there are two elementary schools, specific boundaries that are projected to be more than 100 students over capacity, Sato Elementary School and Bonnie Slope Elementary School. There's also one middle school that is projected to be more than 500 students over capacity. That's Stoller Middle School. And one high school is projected to be almost 600 students over capacity, Westview High School. Next slide. So with that, we would just like to open the floor for 10 minutes or so um, to allow you to ask any questions you might have regarding need. Um, and again, I'd like to encourage you um, to, uh, at the bottom of your screen, use the hand icon uh, to raise your hand and then uh, a Beaverton um, uh, staff support here will allow you, will unmute you and allow you to ask your question. I see Christy is raising her hand and also Liz and we'll take you there. Christy is open. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, um, I have a few questions. Um, it, based on some of the information that I saw um, published online. Um, so it's so that the Cedar Mill capa uh, school capacity was shown as 275 students. Um, but in a previous presentation, it showed that the permanent capacity was 475. Do you know where this discrepancy came from, especially if we're talking about combining schools? Right. Yeah, I think I can uh, address that. And, and if I miss a point, I would um, encourage uh, any of the district staff to chime in on this as well. Yeah, um, you depending on which um, document you had been comparing it to in the past, um, uh, one of the things that we did when we started this assessment is we took a look at how um, basically every bit of data is being calculated. So we're not, we, we started, one of the questions we asked is, um, what formulas are being used to calculate capacity. And I should say out there that there are several different ways in which districts do calculate capacity. And after a number of different conversations regarding 
um, the appropriateness or not appropriateness of a given formula, we all arrived at a, a particular formula to use to calculate capacities at schools. And that formula was a little bit different than previous formulas that were used. And so the result of that is that um, some schools, not all schools, but some schools uh, ended up seeing a different calculated capacity than had been used in the past. Um, and specifically, I just give you one example. What that typically, uh, the formulas typically involve, and, and this is the formula that was used in this case, and I'll get use an elementary school as an example, is we look at the number of general classrooms in a given school. We literally calculate, look at count the number of, of classrooms in a facility. To that is applied the target student uh, seating in each of those classrooms, which is established by the district. And I should mention that changes over time too, depending on a number of different factors. And then a utilization rate is also applied to that, which at the elementary level is an assumed 100% utilization rate. And so th those are the things that cause the discrepancy between the calculated capacities. Okay. Um, and then the other thing was, are, are we going to have another time to ask questions about the proposed plans at a later time? Oh, yes. Time? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then the last thing about district need, um, are those enrollment projections going to be posted online for review? Um, I saw a brief um, uh, splash of the, some of the elementary projections, but um, I didn't find any reports online. Uh, I will defer to um, Steve or one of the other staff members with regard to whether or not they'll be posted. We will be doing that. That will be a part of the um, plan that, that is uh, ultimately published in the um, coming weeks or months. So we hope to have that published you know, here probably in April. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Liz, I see your hand is raised as well. Hi, thank you. It's it's Jordan. I'm sitting here next. Okay. To <laughs> okay. <laughs> My picture and her name. I don't know how that happened. I do. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we had two quick questions. Thanks for uh, taking the time out to answer. The first one was in relation to what I think was the summary slide in this most recent section, where you were projecting enrollment numbers and how far over capacity various schools would be. And I was wondering, we were wondering if those numbers were based on the new middle school boundary lines that have been recently drawn, but not yet enacted. Do, do, uh, do you want to take that, Steve, or would you like me to take that? Yeah. Um, yes, they were, um, as they are on the um, new boundaries. Um, there's you know one um, minor mistake with it in terms of the Meadow Park uh, boundary, but the rest of them are um, accurate. The um, we are using um, those um, projections, but as uh, Mr. Landers just described, how we've changed the uh, you know through this plan, how we're changing the way we're calculating um, that capacity that's where you're going to see some differences. Got it, so Stoller is probably an example of that where we're seeing that 500 number in part exacerbated by the method by which capacity is measured having changed after the district, after the middle school boundaries were redrawn. That is correct. And the just to um, expand on Mr. Lander's uh, explanation about the reason for the change, we, we believe that going off of the former, um, the former formula, while um, it was good and it worked well for us, we feel that this new um, formula is far more um, um, specific on a school by school basis because we're looking at the classrooms and the capacity in those classrooms rather than just a gross um, square footage of the building. Got it. Uh, and the, thank you. And the one follow up, and please correct me because I'm going to have some, my, some of my recollection will be wrong, but I believe at the beginning you said that this discussion and these facility discussions were part of continuing to inform a long range facility plan. I think you, I think you may have said tenure, but I may be wrong on that. I'm curious 
when the last time, when was the last time a discussion, a public discussion and public strategic um, sort of auditing of this process was done? And are, are the conclusions from the most recent round of that facility planning incorporated in this newest round of recommendations? It, this, this round we're reviewing today feels a little bit like it is starting from scratch, but I assume that it is not and that it is a build upon previous recommendations. And if that is the case, I'm curious how and where those previous long range facility recommendations are being taken into this plan. Right, that's a great question. Yeah, the, the last, uh, Frank mentioned early on that um, the last plan that was done was done in 2010. And so we're really at that uh, end of the 10 year cycle where the, um, the state now requires an update of the long range facility plan and there are two um, separate state requirements that identify what needs to be included in that long range facility plan. And very commonly, um, which shouldn't be too much surprise, is that uh, the development of a long range facility plan is followed very commonly um, with a proposal for a capital measure to look at implementing the 10 year capital plan, I'll say 10 year in quotes, um, that is developed as part of the long range plan. And I put that in quotes because districts uh, capital measure or bond cycles vary widely from district to district. Some districts because of their debt situation and their specific community situations are able to opt for going out for capital measures on a five or six year cycle, some four, some eight or 10 years. Um, and so to kind of get to, I think what you're asking is um, one, this is an update, a 10 year update from the, the long range facility plan that was done 10 years ago. And yes, uh, what is done at the beginning of the planning process, which we're in, in right now, is to go back and take a look at what was previously proposed or included in that 2010 long range facility plan. Um, and we look at it from the standpoint of when are any of the factors that contributed to the decision making for that previous plan, have they changed in any way? You know, for example, is enrollment projection shifting or changing? Uh, or, or is there something else um, you know, a, a new educational program that has been brought to the forefront that has changed. And then we also look at whether or not which of the projects that were identified 10 years ago were addressed, you know, which have, have received a lot of modernization, which were replaced, and which ones were remaining that still need to be dealt with. And so as we merge kind of the, the historic kind of carry on uh, from the original plan or the last plan on what what still needed to be done then within the perspective of how need may have changed that's how we develop um, the update to the long range plan and will, will that will that analysis also be made public as you've done with much of this quantitative data today yeah i think the um the if I'm not mistaken, the, the long range facility plan from 2010 uh, was, and if not still is available online, I think the district would probably not have a problem posting that. It's a, it's a public document if you wanted to make the comparison. Um, and I and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Steve, on this, but uh, not to let a cat out of a bag, but I believe at least one of the projects that is being proposed as part of the plan update was a project that was recognized in the previous plan as being a potential, you know, something has should really be done on this site. Am I correct, Steve? You are correct. And, yeah. um, Mr. DeLoper, this is, you know, I think the best way to um, explain it is the 2014, or I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, 2021 plan is standing on the shoulders of the 2010 plan. Mm -hmm. um, we will course correct um, using the uh, capacity calculation formula as an example where, 
you know, we think we can do something better, but we are building from that. And part of our listening to the community is, okay, um, you, you've seen what we've done and um, are there things that we're now missing? And, um, you know, how can we be sure that we include those in the plans? Right. Makes sense. So, so along with um, uh, really recognizing and being responsive to the changing needs as, as they are updated in 10 years, um, it's also an opportunity as long range facility plans are updated to continually assess what I would kind of call best practices. And so that would include things like looking at the way um, capacities are calculated and if there is a better practice or a way to, to go ahead and make those shifts so that um, the long range facility plan is as accurate as we can possibly make it. Steve, if I could add, one part of the question was the public involvement on that 2010 plan. And there was a 25 or 28 person uh, advisory committee that met at least, I believe, six times to develop that plan and to, <clears throat> excuse me, implement uh, the state statute 195-110 at that time. So as, as a part of that, we did the, I happened to work on that plan. Um, there were community open houses as well. So there was a public uh, and a business engagement as part of that plan. Okay. And uh, Leroy, I do note that uh, Mr. Joaquin has um, put in a few questions in the chat. I know um, Aaron Royal um, identified, um, you know, responded a little bit on the um, security needs, but um, the, the question being, you know, how has COVID changed the requirements for schools concerning social distancing, uh, flexibility, social distancing and HVAC systems, but, and also um, security questions about retrofitting existing facilities for um, shooter threats, automatic uh, uh, locking systems, surveillance, sight lines, and main entrance revisions. Um, I can say that we do have um, a number of items um, addressing this. And Mr. Wikina, I'd beg your patience just a, a little bit because as we go into the next um, phase of the presentation, I believe we will be um, addressing um, some of your, um, um, your questions in that, that part. Okay. So um, if there's no other hand raising or um, questions, um, please uh, let's go to the uh, next phase. All right, next slide, please. All right, let's take a quick overview of the long range facility plan proposals. As I mentioned, there are two of them directly associated with the need you've seen. The two plan options that have been discussed by the district, plan option one, which is a no tax rate increase. So as um, Frank mentioned, um, there will be uh, current uh, capital debt that will be sunsetting, um, which allows for a continuation of current taxes without any increase. Um, and that would uh, yield a projected $325 million um, capital measure uh, related to that no tax increase um, with the expectation that that work would be implemented over a four-year bond program timeframe. The second option uh, studied a potential 25 cent uh, tax rate increase. So that's 25 cents per thousand dollars of assessed value um, to give you an order of magnitude just as a uh, quick uh, case study, if a home uh, owner had an assessed home value of $400,000 assessed, that would equate to about $8.33 a month um, in terms of an increase. That uh, is projected at yielding $725 million um, capital measure. Uh, you'll note um, that that level uh, is relatively close 
close to the, the most recent capital measure that was passed um, by the community at 680 million. And the expectation is, is that that work would be done over a seven year bond program. Next slide. When we look at the details of the two proposals together, uh, option one on the left and option two on the right, um, you can see uh, the amounts proposed under each of the key categories. So educational program, you can see that there are special education improvements proposed in each of the two plans and uh, pre-K programs also proposed. Um, in addition on plan two, there are outdoor uh, learning improvements um, and play area improvements, and then also physical education and athletic additions to work towards the state requirements. Under uh, facility condition area of need, um, specifically under the replacement uh, component of it, there were several schools that were identified identified as being potential candidates for replacement rather than modernization due to their condition. This includes Raleigh Hills Elementary School uh, replacement. And I believe that is the project that I, yeah, that's what I, I was referring to as sort of a carryover or a relationship to the previous 10 year plan. And also the possibility of looking at a Beaverton High School replacement. Um, note that in option one, for the $325 million uh, capital measure, Beaverton High School would own, the design and preparation for construction would only be done. In plan option two, the actual project completion of the replacement high school would be done. Um, and in addition, uh, a study or uh, design work for a secondary replacement elementary school would be done as part of option two. And then both are replacing one of the transportation facilities um, in the district. Under modernization, you see a line item for deferred maintenance. Uh, you probably recall that the total maintenance across the district was estimated at 610 million. And so you can begin to see how much of that the district is proposing uh, addressing in a, this particular capital measure. Uh, school modernizations, uh, you can see an increase of 20 million from one plan to the other. Seismic upgrades are being addressed in both of the plans with a little more than twice as many seismic upgrades um, being provided in the second plan security upgrades in both plans with a little more than twice as many security upgrades uh, in plan two and then improvements to nutritional or food service upgrades across the district um, capacity and enrollment there are uh, the proposals include potential classroom additions at certain sites uh, for 10 million and then a series of line items under other support, which include technology, school office uh, relocation, bus replacement, and then other critical equipment that needs to be place, replaced across the district. Um, so you can see kind of the line by line item comparison. Next slide. I should point out that these costs are rough order magnitude um, kind of it estimates um, for each of the components. And so why, why are these being proposed as part of the plan uh, under educational program? Special education improvements, uh, the intention is to adapt the existing special education spaces to be more suitable for their current use and to better support su uh, student needs. Um, within special education. And there's a whole list of things that I won't go through there, um, but you can read them. Uh, under pre-K modifications, uh, the intent is to upgrade existing pre-K spaces to meet the unique needs of young learners. And that would include um, support facilities for those pre-K spaces um, and to bring them in, in alignment with the education specification. Outdoor learning improvements, key objective is to expand outdoor covered play areas at elementary schools across the district. 
for physical education and athletic additions to build a new gym at Stoller Middle School and Barnes Elementary School and provide various improvements to other district athletic facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, for those facilities that fall under replacement, so this is facility conditions and buildings that are in a condition that is so poor that uh, it's worthy considering replacing them. Why Raleigh Hills? Um, if you look at the three charts, bar charts that you've seen earlier, you can see highlighted Raleigh Hills and how it falls into the worst category both from facility condition or FCI. It is the oldest elementary, and it's also in the category of being the worst seismic condition. Um, so you see all of those reasons. It also, on top of that, um, is the highest uh, return on investment from the standpoint of a dollar being spent on energy improvement. More than 45% of the students at this school are eligible for free and reduced lunch, which starts to tie into the equity lens. Um, the existing school capacity is 250 below the district target capacity, which means you would have a better utilization of that school site because you are increasing capacity at that site. And as we mentioned before, it was previously identified as the next priority uh, in the most recent or previous long range facility plan. And of course, replacing it eliminates $12 million of deferred maintenance need off of the list because you'll be replacing it. Next slide. Why is Beaverton High School uh, on the proposal, um, specifically on the, the uh, 25 cent increase proposal, if it's ac actually implemented, you see the three charts on the side. For reference, uh, it is the worst high school um, from a standpoint of uh, condition assessment. Um, it is the large portions of it are the oldest facilities across the entire district, regardless of grade level. And it also falls into the lowest seismic category, um, which is below collapse prevention. Um, it falls in the energy use index of five. So every dollar you would spend on it is going to return the highest improvement from an energy standpoint. More than 50% of the students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So it falls under the uh, lens of providing equity or improving equity across the district. And it makes a significant uh, reduction of deferred maintenance costs. So it eliminates $53 million of deferred maintenance. Next slide. Allen Street Transportation. Um, again, you can see it highlighted on the three charts. Um, it's under the highest level of FCI. Um, it is not one of your older facilities um, and it's not in the worst seismic. However, there are, and this is very notable, um, some significant safety issues at the building that a replacement um, would address. Uh, this includes repairing um, the, the repair bays that are cramped and, um, and really don't have space for the technical repairs uh, to happen. Um, many, a third of the hydraulic lifts there are unusable due to length and uh, age, uh, failed parts. Um, and it's really a major safety issue from the standpoint of um, how buses are able to be managed at that facility. Next slide. From a modernization and capacity and enrollment standpoint, um, the plans uh, address deferred maintenance with the idea that uh, they want to repair and upgrade projects at all facilities across the district to some level with exception of the new ones which don't need um, any deferred maintenance of, of any uh, level. For school modernization, the dollars that have been proposed there are intended to modernize schools to improve the learning environment and enhance student engagement along with improving health, um, he healthy environment and behavior. Uh, seismic upgrades, uh, the intention there is to work at making seismic upgrades that move towards the district target level um, 
and really focusing on the worst performing buildings um, that are not anticipated to be replaced. So if a building is in bad condition, is bad seismically, but is not slated for a potential replacement to really begin to address those buildings seismically. Security upgrades, providing cameras, fencing, and access control upgrades at various schools that need them. Nutrition service upgrades, you notice the line item in both the plans there. That really just handles various projects throughout the district. And there's a, a short list follow-up that I won't go in in detail, but you, you can read it. And then classroom additions, um, looking at adding additional classrooms at Sato Elementary School, Oak Hills Elementary School, and Stoller Middle School to address the capacity needs that have been identified. Next slide. Please. Leroy, if, yes. before we go to this slide, I just want to note, um, based on Mr. Joaquin's prior um, question, we don't have the fine print after security upgrades. I think cameras and fencing are fairly uh, self-explanatory in terms of what we're looking to do there, but access control. Also, you know, it includes you know, putting in the vestibules and rearranging offices to create a, um, you know, a secure entrance at buildings, but it also includes um, bringing our card control access um, so we don't have you know, physical keys anymore, but badges to get into buildings. And in terms of access control with um, um, the buildings, you know, some examples include Westview High School, Aloha High School, and Cooper Mountain, where their offices are inside the building. So you have to gain entry to the building before you can get there. So we want to reverse that where to get in, you have to go to the office. So that is our secure point. Um, those are just three examples. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Stephen. So again, just to uh, remind you of the comparison really quick, um, here are the, the various line items that are identified. And I'll just let you kind of look at that really quickly. And we can come back to this during the Q&A if we need to. So next slide. So now um, we have two little um, pieces left, both of which are directly soliciting input from you. The first of these is a um, kind of a, hopefully a verbal discussion or Q&A session of which I see Sarah has got her hand up. This will be followed um, by a six question, real quick survey that we'll do here. Um, and we'll leave about 20 minutes for that. So. Um, Sarah, you had your hand up first with a question. Good evening. Hi, this is Sarah. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, and have you looked at if the, if the capacity is within the existing school buildings, um, it, especially for the elementary schools, if, um, if boundary adjustments were made throughout the whole district, if there would be capacity um, without building, having to build a new, a, a new elementary school for, especially for elementary and the middle school level, um, is there capacity throughout the district if there, if the boundaries were to be adjusted? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, there is at every grade level uh, excess capacity district wide. Um, so, uh, you know, theoretically, um, any. Uh, over enrollment at a given boundary level could be addressed through the adjustment of a boundary. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, as the person who does the boundary adjustments, I'd like to emphasize um, Mr. Lander's use of the word theoretically. Um, there's, it is possible, we do have um, capacity, but um, not all boundary adjustments are created equal given the um, other factors that go into it, um, such as proximity, transportation costs, neighborhood, um, you know, the demographic of the school, you know, things like that. So while we can certainly address and will address capacity concerns um, through boundary adjustments, 
it's not the um, necessarily the right answer in every case. Uh, I see there's uh, another question from Christy. Yes, thanks. Um, I noticed that. Uh oh. We lost Christy, Debbie. It, yeah, we did. We did. There she is. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Huh? Um, I noticed that the presentation tonight didn't describe anything for the elementary school replacement. Um, that's for the proposal to replace Cedar Mill and West TV with a combined elementary school. Um, it, has something changed between when that the presentation was published and um, the thoughts going on tonight? Steve, do, would you like to address that? Yeah. So, Christy, uh, no, nothing's changed. What we have um, characterized it in the presentation as um, study for replacements in the um, um, in the materials, so that it may be um, you know Sear Mill West TV. It could be Fir Grove. It could be any of our elementary schools that have um, um, you know. That are scoring not so well on age, facility condition, um, enrollment, and the like. The you know the most likely there is going to be West TV and um, Cedar Mill because of their age and um, other factors. So um, it's not that we're it's off the list. It's that we're trying to be you know a little more inclusive. That it's not just those um, schools. Got it. Okay, that's. I was just curious what the plan was for um, for that particular line item. Yeah, we're we're still looking at it, um, and a lot of that is planning for um, you know a future future bond. So um, if we were to get a bond, um, you know, um, you know, approved by the voters, and it if one of the plans that we've shown here tonight is what it is. It would be studies. It would not actually be a um, knock down and rebuild and you know come up with a new school. That would be further down the road. Okay, because um, the main reason I was curious is that it, it seems like neither site has the space for a 750 student school, um, and so I was curious where that, with discussions or thoughts of where that might be located. Um, or if property would have to be purchased. So that's part of the um, um, study that we want to do is to understand, you know, what options are available to us, what um, needs would be required. Um, you know, would we build a 750 school? Could we build a 750 student school? Would we have to, re you know, acquire additional land? Those are all the questions that we need to um, spend time on and studying very carefully. Okay, thank you very much. And the one thing I would add to, um, to that kind of conversation is for any one of these, when we're um, getting ready to ask a series of questions of you here, this um, Christie's question gets right at the heart of you know, some of the plan thinking, so to speak, in that um, for that particular example, there are really probably three options on the table for it. One is to um, plan on doing it in a subsequent round of work. So doing it later outside of this phase of potential work, that's one option. Another option is to increase the bond amount. So you're asking the public to pass a larger bond, which as you might expect becomes more and more difficult as you ask for more and more. Or the third option is to reallocate funds within a given proposal. So you would have to borrow or take funds, so to speak, from one line item and reallocate it to that. So just kind of throwing that out there as approaches that are considered by the planning group. Are there any other um, questions I, and also if, if one of you are watching chats that would be good uh, I, i'd like to jump in Leroy, on, yes on mr joaquin's question about um, covid 
And um, he had asked earlier, has COVID changed the requirements for schools, the flexibility, Steve talked about that, social distancing, HVAC. So I included the link from the Oregon Department of Education and the Oregon Health Authority on their Ready School Safe Learners. And I think he's trying to get to, is there a change in how we design our facilities? What are we looking at? I mean, that remains to, uh, to be seen, you know, across, you know, I can think of across not only Oregon, but across the nation. But within that guidance from, from the Department of Education, um, it's changing operation. Like you have to have a minimum of 35 square feet per student, talks about social distancing requirements, cohort requirements, um, the wearing of face covering. So that's what we know as, of as of today. And we continue to, to follow that guidance. Um, and then he had a follow on question about, uh, you know, regarding the, the guidance, does the FCI take into account or is a follow-up planning work required for that? So what I can say about the FCI is that is a indicator of facility condition. So when you take the total um, deferred maintenance costs over the cost of the replacement value, it doesn't take into account any of those requirements that are in the guidance. Something that we can look at as a district in our planning is when you look at HVAC, let's say, how does that fit into um, reducing the risk of COVID? Do we move an HVAC system up that needs to be replaced and you know, compared to uh, windows or any other part of the system? So that's something that we're uh, looking into. And um, you know, it may influence our, our planning and our prioritization as we move forward. I hope that addresses his, uh, his questions. And what I would add to is, um, to my knowledge, although I would say I'm, I'm not up on the absolute latest research, um, I'm not aware of any um, scientific studies that have indicated um, specifically improvements, HVAC improvements, say in schools, and what the, um, the sort of proven result of them are from the standpoint of the safety of the environment. And I think um, you know, we'll be as designers of educational facilities really trying to keep ahead of this as much as we can, because we want to make sure that if any district spends a dollar to upgrade their system, that in fact, the, the proven results of it um, show that it matters. If it doesn't matter, then obviously you don't want to be spending money on those things. I know that uh, Mr. Joaquin has his hand raised, but we'll give the floor to Jordan. I think Jordan had his hand up first before we go to uh, Mr. Joaquin. So Jordan, if you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah, and we're really going to confuse you because it is Liz this time. <laughs> but Jordan's <still> <laughs> um, as a Valley Hills parent, I, I first want to thank you and show appreciation for seeing our school name in those slides. I know the community has, um, this has been a long time coming for the community. And I know that, you know, parents have been told that this, this rebuild will be coming and will be prioritized in the next bond. Um, but it is a huge relief to see it in see it in writing and know that that is part of the planning process. Cause I know that's been a, a, a big concern for families for a long time. Um, I have two quick questions. The first one, being that this time around right now, the district does not have a vacant facility that would house students during those transitional times, unlike sort of the previous uh, several rebuilds, what would the district do, you know, to rebuild an elementary school? Where would those students be located in that interim period? Um, and then my second question is the timeline for when you expect the bond to go to voters. What year are you anticipating that would go to folks? Okay, um, two very loaded questions. So um, I will do the best I can recognizing that we can't make commitments here today about things that uh, require action of our board in the future. But as they stand today, in turn, you're absolutely right. We do not have a vacant building in which to use as, you know, in which to put students as a swing school site. However, we do have um, buildings that are um, underutilized and there are um, 
opportunities for us to look at um, how to use those buildings more efficiently. For example, and I'm only using this as an example, um, Cedar Park Middle School, which is relatively close to Raleigh Hills, um, is, you know, it has a small student body. And will there be enough room um, to locate um, you know, the Raleigh Hills students at that um, site? That's something that, we're, uh, that we would look at. We'd also want to you know, understand, is that even appropriate to do? Um, in terms of, you know, mixing uh, kids um, of different grade ages. So this is very early days for, um, you know, looking at that, but that is something that we are actively um, considering and looking at all of our options um, to do that. In terms of a bond um, schedule, it depends on, um, there are a lot of things that need to happen for a bond to be referred to the voters. But let's just say for argument's sake, it is referred to the voters in um, 2022. Uh, the first election in 2022 would be in May. If the uh, bond was referred to the voters and if Raleigh Hills or other projects look at, look, because you're asking about Raleigh Hills, if Raleigh Hills is included in that bond proposal, you know, we would need to get an approval in um, May 2022. If we got that approval, we would then have to sell bonds to be able to, um, you know, get the uh, money to do the construction. The construction, I would estimate, would be a lot like uh, what was with ACMA, which would be at least a year and a half um, type of um, construction. And so it, you know, you can see how it just takes time um, to, to do that. Now, one of the ways that we're trying to um, uh, make that happen quicker is we're going to use some of the money that we have um, for 20, um, with the 2014 bond is to go and do the design work and land use entitlements and permitting through the city and Washington County. It's, as you know, is a complicated site with jurisdictional issues, access issues and the like. So if we can get that done early, that you know, those approvals remain valid. And, um, you know, when a bond does get approved to uh, fund it, we've, um, you know, we've saved months, if not a year's in getting that uh, permitting done. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Joaquin has his hand raised. And uh, I don't want to invite any uh, apologies. Uh, the last name is Joquin. It's just like oh, oh, <laughs> it's, it's just like the San Joquin Valley in California. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to just comment the kinds of uh, improvements that I was uh, curious about that the plan hopefully would account for are uh, just increased flexibility in, in the school uh, design layouts. Um, in case in point, if you're um, uh, suddenly uh, hit with a scenario where uh, you're leveraging all of your facilities just to conduct elementary school across the district uh, and you have, uh, you know, minimum space uh, requirements, uh, social distance, uh, it would be uh, useful, uh, enlightened if uh, said plans included like demountable partitions uh, between classrooms so that you could double the size of adjacent classrooms and, you know, effectively put uh, the same students together in the same space, just further apart. Um, I think that there are overall health benefits, uh, despite not being um, COVID-19 uh, uh, proven effective uh, to uh, minimize exposures to common influenzas by increasing the uh, um, air exchanges, uh, you know, getting closer to 100%. Uh, um, improving the filtration, uh, better ongoing maintenance, as I believe Mr. Uh, uh, your facilities representative uh, had indicated earlier. And um, um, uh, I just also wanted to ask the question, um, as a Beaverton um, city homeowner, I have no objections at all with uh, paying an additional assessment to support plan two or even more improvements However, uh, given the history
history of um, uneven um, real estate values, poor neighborhoods versus wealthy neighborhoods, and the volatility of the real estate market uh, and uh, education and school, uh, schools, neighborhoods, districts suffering as a result of downturns in that market. Are there any other uh, funding plans, uh, funding sources that your plan considers? Uh, the, as of now, the only other real source of substantial funds would come from the state. And even those funds are relatively limited um, when compared to the overall need. So districts um, uh, in the last decade, um, the state uh, finally implemented a program that um, allows for matching grants for districts that meet certain criteria and are able to pass their own capital measure. And those grants, the maximum grant, at least as it's currently defined, uh, is an $8 million matching grant. So um, while that's a substantial amount of money and, and is you know, great to have, um, it's uh, only a small amount relative to you know, a 700 plus million dollar need. Um, occasionally, districts will um, be able to arrange partnerships with different organizations. So we have seen and participated in partnerships with boys and girls clubs where they sh may end up sharing a site and they actually co-locate so that they don't have to duplicate certain facilities and thereby reduce cost. But generally speaking, the primary source of capital um, through which districts can make improvements on their facilities or add capacity is through the passing of a capital measure. That's the state of Oregon. Well, hopefully it will change. Yeah, it's, there's um, incremental change happening, um, but it is, it's slow. I would point out one thing that uh, we have been doing pretty successfully, and um, Mr. Boyle has done this, where we have um, been aggressive in applying for seismic grants from the state, which we've been successful in getting funded, which are, you know, we're using to leverage with our um, bond dollars to, you know, extend them um, to, you know, help more schools um, in, in seismic upgrades. The, the one thing I will note too, and I'm sure um, many, if not all of you know this, but one of the differences between um, your taxes as they relate to um, the operational costs of a district and your taxes as they relate to the capital costs or construction related costs is that your taxes go into a kind of a general fund, so to speak, um, when as they relate to operations, and then the state has a certain calculus they use to distribute those funds. Whereas if your community passes a capital measure or a bond, those funds stay in your district to repair or modernize your facilities. They don't go anywhere else, so. I would add too that those um, the bonds, the tax rate, they don't tend to fluctuate a lot. Like, like you might see the real estate market fluctuate and that's because it's based on the assessed value of your home, which is usually less than market rate. And that, I mean, that doesn't really tend to fluctuate too much. So it's pretty stable. And the, the funding is, it's, it's pretty conservative too when they look at um, those assessment rates. Uh, it, 2008 wasn't that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, a very painful reminder. <laughs> yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and I, I want to say that those are great comments about um, strategies to, potential strategies to address COVID and, and for that matter, flu and other things too. And all of those things um, are on the dashboard and being considered um, when, and, the discussions and the relationship of the cost to make improvements of that sort, but 
they're all um, useful strategies. So Roy, um, being respectful of everyone's time, we have 15 minutes yes. uh, left here. It's been a very good discussion, but we do have some more things to um, share with or work with our uh, guests here. Okay. Do you want to take one more hand, more hand up? Maybe if okay. we could just address that really quickly. Um, sure. And then we'll go quickly into the questions. So Ms. Booth. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I just had a follow-up question related to timeline and schedule. I also have kids um, who go to Raleigh Hills and will go to Beaverton High School. So of course I'm very relieved to see that those priorities are being kept for all the reasons that you've covered. Um, and I just wonder, uh, you know, I'll use my first grader as an example. Her kindergarten and first grade was obviously disrupted because of COVID, as everyone's was. She could potentially be relocated, you know, maybe third or fourth or fifth grade um, when Raleigh Hills is rebuilt. And then Whitford and Beaverton are also slated for improvements. And so I'm just wondering, will the timeline take that into consideration to make sure that some of our students aren't being relocated or disrupted you know, every year as they move through these schools. Yeah. Our, our board is certainly sensitive to those kinds of things. And, um, you know, one of the things that we would, um, you know, consider when we're doing any kind of improvements is, you know, I, I talked about, you know, moving students in a um, swing school situation. We could also potentially do work where it's occupied construction. So think of the um, Kaiser Clinic on uh, Western and BH Highway, where they built the building and yet still um, kept the, um, you know, the staff and patients using the old building. So there's possibilities where um, that disruption would be, you know, not having to move to another location or anything like that. But, you know, obviously it'd be just disruption to be, you know, studying and, you know, doing your activities next to a, an active construction site. So um, all those things are taken into consideration. Um, whether or not it would be enough to um, halt a project, I, I don't think so, but it would certainly be enough to consider um, how the phasing of a project works. You know, should we do one first and then another or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, I had heard it at previous meetings that the, the, the plan was leaning toward relocating students because you could get the project done much quicker and prior projects had been stalled quite a bit trying to do it while school is in session. It, right, um, and those are part of the trade-offs that we have to consider when we're looking at, um, at those projects. Yeah, yeah, so your second part kind of more gets to my question, which is like if Beaverton and Raleigh Hills, for example, were started at the same time, then one student, one group age of students is not gonna be impacted by both of those builds. Well, we think the best way to get um, children into the um, construction trades is to have them in a construction zone for their entire academic career. So um, we'll see. I'm kidding. Please, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so we do have six quick questions that we should probably move through, and I'll um, give you some instructions as we move into them. So next slide here. Okay. So uh, we'll have one slide for each question. And what we are hoping you will be able to do is um, provide your input or answer this question uh, through the chat. And so for each question, what we'd like you to do is begin by typing in, in this case, one, which is the number of the question. So type in one and then a space and then answer the question. And you'll have, um, let's see if we can do maybe uh, two 
two minutes or so per question, something like that. And then I'll give you a, a warning maybe 30 seconds beforehand or so. Okay, we have about 30 seconds till the next question. Okay, so hopefully all of you have had your ch a chance to enter your answer. So let's move on to question number two. Next slide, please. So type in the number two and then your answer to the question. Okay, we have about 30 seconds left. Okay, about another five seconds. Okay, let's move on to question number three. Type in three, please, and then answer the question. Is there anything that is missing from the proposals? Something that you think should be there, whether it be from the standpoint of need or to garner support. And if you think the plans look good, you can just say, no, nothing is missing. <laughs>
about 30 seconds left. Okay, let's move on to four. Type in the letter number four. And do you see anything in the proposals that should not be in there? Whether that be that it does not reflect need or whether or not it causes problem from the standpoint of support for some reason. Well, Roy, I think it might be useful to scan back to the comparison sheet of the two um, bond proposals sure. for folks, I mean, temporarily, yeah. just to kind of jog memories. Okay, about 30 seconds. Okay, why don't we move to the fifth question? Thank you. So please type in number five. And then for this one, what we would like you to do is of these eight items that have been kind of summarized, some of them have been combined together. Uh, can you identify your top three priorities in order? So if you are top priority was Raleigh Hills replacement, you would have the number five and then B followed by the letter of your second highest priority, and then the letter of your third highest priority. Okay, about 30 seconds. Okay, five seconds left. Okay, why don't we move to our last question. So please type in six. And then we just would like to know from a demographic standpoint, what school or community you are most affiliated with. And also what your relationship to the district is, whether you're a current parent or a someone who had children in the district previously 
or just an interested community member. Okay, about 30 seconds. And while people are finishing up, I would just say thank you all very much uh, on behalf of the entire planning team. Um, we really appreciate the time that you've carved out of your busy lives to um, take a look at the information so far associated with the plan and provide this input. Um, we will be taking the input you've given, the questions you've asked um, and back as a group and be talking about how they might influence further plan development. Um, and we will be having this week two more open house meetings, one tomorrow afternoon and one on Thursday evening, which will then be followed with uh, a meeting with our 12 person focus group, um, all with the intent of further refining and developing the plan for submission to the superintendent for consideration. So thank you so much, we really appreciate it. I don't know, Steve, would you like to say something? Yes, um, I can echo exactly what Mr. Landers said about thanking you all and taking the time to do this. Fortunately, it's storming outside in South Beaverton, so um, it's not like I'm outside enjoying um, the evening. Um, I am happy to take anybody's questions, comments, um, as they may occur um, you know, after this meeting. Please feel free to e email me. I will be at Raleigh Hills um, PTO meeting next week. Um, so I am very appreciative of the prep for that meeting. I hope to have a, a thorough and robust conversation with um, the membership there. Now, my email address is Stephen Sparks. Please use Stephen with an N um, on that because if you just do Steve Sparks, a very nice custodian up at Bonnie Slope is going to be getting a flood of emails. And I don't want him to get the flood of emails because for every 10 he gets, I owe him an hour of weed polling. So please um, send it to Stephen Sparks. And it's the usual um, 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 suffix of at beaverton.ka.or.us or K12 rather. So beaverton.k12.or.us. So um, Josh has put that in the um, text. So if, or in the chat box, so if I get any um, forwarded email from Steve Sparks, I know that you're sandbagging me and making me pull weeds. So um, thank you very much. And uh, we will be posting this um, recording on our webpage so you can refer your friends to it. Um, please feel free to come to the um, um, open houses tomorrow and Thursday. And um, if you felt this was worthwhile, please recommend your um, friends and colleagues to uh, join us at that, at those future upcoming meetings. And uh, with that, I say we're done. So thanks very much.